Modern TV series gives us powerful heroine, but often with very different approaches on their characterization. Today we are going to discuss two protagonists who embody strength and vulnerability in radically opposite ways. Vi from Arcane and Galadriel from Rings of Power. While Vi is one of the best written protagonists I have seen in recent years, Galadriel is one of the worst. They also have many similarities in their story arcs, so I think it is interesting to compare them in order to understand how to write strong female characters. A topic on which I will reveal no less than two top secrets at the end of the video. Secrety secrets. I'd like to let you in on a secret. What are the strengths and weaknesses of these characters? And why does Vi seem so authentic and easy to relate to, while Garadriel seems distant and irritating as a straight jacket of poison ivy and metals? Let's find out together. Also, you'll find my books Odyssey to Trappist One and The Cult of the Endeavor on Amazon in ebook and paperback. The links are in the description, check them out. Vi is one of the main characters in Arcane, the animated series in the world of League of Legends. She is an incredibly strong fighter who grew up in the slums of Zone, but her character is defined by more than just her strength. Vi is pragmatic, loyal, but most of all deeply scared by the traumas of her childhood, especially in her complicated relationship with her sister, Jinx. Hi. Galadriel, on the other hand, is the mighty elven warrior of Rings of Power, set in the Lord of the Rings universe. That is, the horribly Amazon's distorted version. A warrior and charismatic leader, Galadriel is portrayed as a character fighting against the darkness, driven by personal loss and a determination to defeat Sauron. However, her portrayal has been criticized for being one-dimensional and rigid. Arcane opens with Vi wandering with her little sister Powder to the site of a battle between Zone and Piltover, discovering that their parents are dead. And as Vander leads them to safety, Vi glances with rage at Piltover. Galadriel is portrayed in a very similar way, we see her on a battlefield when the battle is over and then in front of her brother's lifeless body. Vi's emotional reaction to the death of her parents is very strong. She is devastated and in tears. Galadriel, on the other hand, is cold and expressionless, as she will be throughout the whole season. I think they wanted to go for the aesthetic of seraphic perfection that Galadriel has in Peter Jackson's films, but they forgot the context and saw this image of her as an icy beauty with a single tear streaming down her face instead of being poetic comes across as cold and distant. Worse, they resort to a voiceover to explain that Galadriel is taking the vow to destroy Sauron that was her brother's. And there, in the darkness, his vow became mine. By comparison, we get much more from Vi without hearing a single word out of her mouth. Not all characters are the same, just as people are not the same. And not everybody has to react in the same way. But in a scene where loved ones are lost after a terrible battle and the protagonist develops a visceral hatred for the enemy, the result is that Vi makes you empathize, while Galadriel keeps you at a distance. By this time, watching Arcane, you're already burning to know how the story will continue. By this time, watching Rings of Power, you're still there, basking in the metaphor of the brothers' boat. Do you know why a ship floats and a stone cannot? And thinking that, all in all, there's one less pretentious idiot in the world. Because the stone sees only downward. And that might as well be good. After a few years in Arcane and a few centuries in Rings of Power, we see our protagonist embark on a dangerous mission. It is not the first one they face, as they have both become leaders of the group, but it is the first one that we are shown because it proves to be important for the plot. In order to carry out the mission, they disobey their respective authorities, Vander on one side and Gilgalad on the other. Ironically, both missions involve climbing, 
building on one side and an icy wall on the other. Vi and her friends are petty thieves and they set out to steal a fortune by sneaking into an apartment of the wealthy area of Piltover, despite Vander's warning not to stir our trouble in the city above Zone, because the peace between Piltover and Zone is precarious. Galadriel, on the other hand, obsessed with finding Sauron, who everyone else believes is dead, but whom she suspects is still alive, keeps pushing her company further and further away, despite Gilgala's order to return home. Rings of Power is quick to make us realize just how skilled Galadriel is, showing her leaving her companions behind on the icy wall because they are slower to climb. It is all very well for her to be more skilled than them, but to leave them behind in this way only makes her selfish. A toxic leader who, if you're not up to her standards, is prepared to abandon you rather than help you. Vi, on the other hand, despite being far more capable than her own team, stays with them, encourages them, and is willing to help them in their time of need. This is what a leader worthy of the name does. She inspires you, she guides you, she makes possible to achieve goals you never thought possible. She doesn't leave you to face danger alone. The difference in leadership became apparent in the moment one of the group members has a problem. In Arcane, Powder is smaller and weaker than the other group members, and when she has to jump from the roof of one building to another, she panics and freezes. We are only at the beginning of the story, but the characterization is already becoming complex. Powder is very attached to Vi, even clingy. After all, the sister is the last surviving member of her family, but she also wants to make her proud and help the group but she is small and not as strong and agile as the others. Vi wants to include Powder so that she does not feel alone, but is aware of her sister's difficulties. The other members of the group see Powder as a burden, and Milo, in particular, openly complains about her and criticizes Vi for her decision to take her along blaming her for her sister's failure. Thus, Vi not only wants Powder to succeed in order to redeem herself in the eyes of the others, but also wants her to succeed because otherwise it would be her failure as a leader. So Vi's feelings are a mixture of affection for her sister and a touch of personal pride. Vi knows Powder well and knows that she is capable of making the leap, she just needs to get over the mental block. Knowing that her sister wants to feel like a productive member of the group and not just a burden, she takes advantage of this feeling and Powder takes courage and overcomes the obstacle with her own strength. The best possible ending. Gladriel, on the other hand, leads her party away from home into the ice, even though they complain they want to return home as the king ordered. When they tell her they are tired and want to camp, Galadriel refuses, forcing them to continue once again, at night, in the middle of raw terrain, full of crevices and with a blizzard approaching. They have been searching for Sauron for hundreds of years and do not even know if they are in the right place. There was no reason not to camp and rest at least for a little. When one of their own falls to the ground and seems unable to continue, Galadriel almost looks as if she would rather let him die than slow down. I think their intention was to show Galadriel's strength and determination, however, they more effectively showed her obsession, recklessness, a lack of respect for her group and poor leadership. Vi comes across as a more empathetic and dependable leader. You don't have to be an asshole to be powerful. Being an asshole just makes you an asshole. Vi comes out of this scene more determined than ever. Galadriel, on the other hand, has already irritated everyone. At the end of the mission, time for the first battle for both stories. Vi and her people had made a good haul and returned to zone, but are attacked by older children who want to take possession of it. Galadriel and her party encounter a troll in a cave. Vi finds herself surrounded, and though she is tough, she knows her companions are not as tough, especially Powder. However, her resentment for the boys who are threatening her and her pride will not allow her to give up the booty. And she chooses the path of violence. As she usually says in the game, Vi stands for violence. Vi? 
stands for violence. Even in this context, she is concerned about protecting Powder. She is too small to participate in the fist fight, so Vi entrusts her with the bag of loot and tells her to run away. In the end, Vi emerges victorious, but ragged and bleeding. As she is often reminded throughout the series, she is impulsive and her style lacks the wisdom that you urge you to keep your guard up, trying to avoid to receive fists while you're trying to fist other people. Galadriel is not even present at the beginning of the battle with the troll. She is elsewhere exploring the cave and takes a while to notice the problem. 20 seconds of battle. Her subordinates are mowed down while she stands by. And when she does intervene, she kills the troll in a matter of seconds with a few well-aimed blows. Vi is a good fighter, but far from perfect. Galadriel, on the other hand, defeats the troll without even messing her hair. This makes the confrontation in Arcane much more interesting. Vi is not sure she can win and is worried about the others, especially Powder, getting killed. Galadriel, on the other hand, knows that the troll poses no challenge to her, and yet she enters the battle with all the composture of the world, not caring that her soldiers are being beaten up to pulp by the troll's knuckles. No wonder they decided to mutiny. After the failure of their respective missions, both Vi and Galadriel return home, confronting the authority they defied, and are both scolded. Vi returns home empty-handed and bruised, and Vander scolds her for putting everyone in danger and criticizes her leadership. Vi is frustrated by Vander's unwillingness to fight to change her situation, and feels constrained by his pacifist approach. She wants to act and is not satisfied with Vander's pragmatism, wanting more active and immediate change. She fails to understand that reigniting an open conflict with Piltover, the first to pay the price would be the most vulnerable, the children, like her and Powder. Vi is young and impulsive, she has not yet learned to balance emotion with rationality. We will see her grow in these regards as the series progresses. As soon as she returns from the expedition, Galadriel is summoned to the Elven Court and told to abandon her quest for Sauron, since the war is over. Gilgalad offers her to sail west to Valinor, but Galadriel refuses to accept the end of the conflict. Valadriel is idealistic and unyielding, willingly to openly defy authority to further her cause, based on nothing more than a personal feeling that Sauron is still alive, a feeling that seems to be the result of her obsession. At the end she happens to be right, we all know she is right, but she had no evidence to think what she think. Her refusal to listen to other point of view and adapt to new circumstances make her seem isolated and obsessed, showing a side of her leadership that could alienate her followers. This behavior works for Vi, who is still a child at this point in the story and needs to grow up and learn the complexities of the world, but Galadriel is over 3000 years old. To see her behave like a child is unacceptable. After the failure and the washout, it is time for the two to confront the other protagonist of the story. Powder was chased during the confrontation and in order to save herself, has to dispose of the loot by throwing the bag into the river. In fact, she thwarted their efforts and caused the mission to fail because she was not strong enough. This hits her on an already open wound and Milo turns on her even more. Vi is frustrated by his sister's weaknesses, but she intervenes to protect her and comfort her despite the failure. Once again, Vi shows her compassionate and protective nature, but with an understandable hint of irritation that she hide from the sister. Elrond tries to reason with Galadriel and convince her to let go of her obsession with Sauron. However, Galadriel remains firm in her convictions. Despite Elrond's attempt to make her see the bigger picture and convince her that peace is possible, even in a confrontation with an ally and friend, Galadriel demonstrates an emotional rigidity and inability to abandon her personal mission that is truly frustrating. I added this scene at the analysis to emphasize how much Galadriel lacks connection as a character. Her only friend seems to be Elrond, 
her brother died in the war. It is implied that, as far as she know, Celeborn, her husband, died in the same war, but for some reason she never talks about it or thinks about it, and otherwise she seemed to have been unable to develop any other relationship in 3000 years. In the scene I don't know if the comparison between Galadriel and Vi or Galadriel and Powder works better. Vi takes on the responsibility of being the older sister, taking care of Powder, her mental as well as physical health, worrying about her difficulties fitting within the group. In Rings of Power, on the other hand, Galadriel is the one to be comforted. Galadriel rejects all responsibility to Elrond, to Gil-galad, abandoning them all to follow her own obsession, not caring for others, so I am sure they also lost someone in the war. The series never show a moment of suffering for anyone else other than Galadriel's brother, even ignoring Celeborn's supposed death. Galadriel acts as if she is the only one suffering, which makes her incredibly selfish. A character motivation, what they want, what they desire, is what drives them to action, is therefore a key element in their characterization. As we have seen, Arcane begins with Vi resenting the people of Piltover for the death of her parents, but it's not only the desire for revenge that motivates her. Later she will tell Vander, I grew up knowing that I was worth less than them, that my place is down here, I want Powder to have more than that, and I'm willing to fight. This makes her motivation complex, the result of both anger and love. The desire for revenge is typical of anti-heroes, but it is a double-edged sword, it can make a character extremely charismatic, or it can make him selfish, bitter and poisonous. Combined with the desire to fight for Powder's future, this makes Vi a true heroine, while the desire for revenge makes her flawed. It is a very successful mix that creates a character we can see ourselves in, and even even admire. Galadriel's motivation, on the other hand, is based on hatred and obsession. When Halbrand asks her why she continues to fight, she replies, because I cannot stop. Galadriel is motivated only by revenge and is really more of an anti-heroine. And that would be fine, I really like anti-heroes and characters with grey morale. But it is obvious that this was not their intention, because the show is built on the expectation that the audience will become attached to Galadriel and empathize with her. This may well happen with a well-written anti-hero. However, Galadriel comes off as a rather bitchy anti-hero, because the show tries to present her as a flawless and fearless heroine, and the more they try to make her look strong, the more bitchy, perfect and obsessive Galadriel turns out to be. And they don't even realize that doing this makes us hate her even more. Both must deal with authority figures in order to achieve their goals. For Vi it is the Council of Piltover, for Galadriel it is the ruler of Numenor. Vi stands before the people who were in charge when the war between Piltover and Zon took place, in which her parents died. Some of the council members are young, but most have blood on their hands. And yet she remains calm, understanding that angering them would be counterproductive. And she only became angry when it is clear that they will not get what they asked for in the hearing. Galadriel, on the other hand, has no personal reason to hate the Numenorians. Sure, they have become arrogant even toward the elves who gave them the island where they now live, but this is little, especially since they just save her from drowning because she throw herself at sea instead of uh, sailing to Valinor. Yet she arrives at her court as if she were going to war, shouting and insulting the king, the regent and all the Numenorians, accusing them of forgetting they owe all their wealth to the elves and that, all things considered, they should be kissing her feet and her ass and giving her everything she asks for, without batting an eyelid or daring to open their mouth. At one point she even threatens them with death. When the Queen Regent replies that her people does not get the island for free, but paid it with blood, meaning that the Numenorians helped the elf in war, Galadriel replies, if blood is the price of passage, then I'm willing to pay it. What was she going to do? 
wipe out everyone who stood between her and the ship? During that scene I could not believe my ears. It was like watching a chess game with a pigeon at the moment where the bird knocks down all the pawns and shit on the board. And Galadriel was the pigeon. As cool as the Numenorians were, they were diplomatic. They were just trying to uh, understand Galadriel's intention and what would be best for Numenor itself. Galadriel blows it all in 30 seconds. One of the worst tests of diplomacy I have seen in my life. From an elf with thousands of years of experience who looks like a hormonal teenager, Galadriel makes a fool of herself looks like a reckless lunatic and hurts her own cause by being a bitch. I understand that she's angry, but her brother died a century ago. And it seems that the screenwriters had no other way to show us her strength than to make her a steamroller to run over everything and everyone. Many more examples could be given, but this is long enough. In conclusion, Vi and Galadriel are both strong women, but they could not be more different. On the one hand we have Vi, complex and multifaceted. On the other we have Galadriel, whose only personality is her own obsession with Sauron. Vi is a pragmatic leader, willing to make compromises and sacrifices to protect her family, friends and the people of Zone. Galadriel is driven by an absolute ideal, rigid as a crystal sword and unable to adapt to any situation, either for the sake of others or for the sake of the mission. Vi is a compassionate leader, weighing decisions and considering the good of those around her. And though she may fall at times, she is able to learn from her mistake and revise her decisions. Galatriel is mission-obsessed, unable to listen or to understand the fears, doubt and need of those around her and comes across as aloof and unpleasant. Vi combines physics strength with emotional leadership that evolves over the course of the series. Vi is ready to fight, but also deeply touched by personal bonds in a combination of strength and vulnerability. While Galadriel is an extraordinary warrior, she lacks the emotional component that would make her a real person. It is impossible to relate to her, to sympathize with her, or even to want to follow her or deal with her. The characters in Arcane are one of the reasons you will keep watching the series. The characters in Rings of Power are one of the reasons you will drop it. I am more and more puzzled how often big productions fail to create decent female characters. They almost always make them perfect, irritating Mary Sues. That's why I'm glad there are shows like Arcane that show how well you can write a female protagonist, including one with an LGBT component so that no one can say woke ideology is a problem for stories, as I heard someone say. The real problem I I think is overcompensation. Historically women has always been excluded from action roles, partially because of tradition and partially because of sexism. Think of James Bond and the Bond girls, who for so long were just cute chicks with a secondary role inserted to sketch out a romance, who are now cute chicks with a slightly less secondary role inserted to sketch out a romance. So I can imagine modern screenwriter and director saying, let's subvert a classic stereotype of the action man, let's make him a woman. Gosh, she's one of the first to have a role like that, we're going to make her so powerful, she will be super strong and super likable and with that touch of self-centeredness and irony that people like so much in this kind of male characters. But maybe because they get carried away, maybe because they are afraid of looking sexist, they forget to give them flows and make them flawed or even moderate. And so we get these tank-armored women who are always right, they are strong, they are determined, they know everything and they can do everything in the face of everyone without caring about anyone around them. And they turn out to be unpleasant. You will say, there are a lot of male protagonists who have exactly the same problem. And indeed, they are obnoxious too. Just thinks of James Bond again. Not all of them, 
but a good portion. The time has finally come to reveal you the two top secrets you need to know in order to write a strong woman. First, there is no difference between a strong woman and a strong man. You just have to write a good character. People are just people, like characters are just character. Gender, male or female, is just a skin you put on the characterization, just in, as in video games. Especially if the story has a huge action component and the issues related to the character are not related to their gender. So if you're not dealing with issues such as sexism, sexual or gender identity. A good character is just a good character and should work in both genders. Do you think it would have worked less well if Vi has been a boy? Or that Gladder would have been less irritating if she had been a man? No. One exercise you can do in these cases is to change the gender of your character. Think of them as the opposite gender. Would they work the same way? It may feel strange at first, but it can help you identify some problems. Second, acting like an asshole makes you look like an asshole, male or female. Especially if the show or movie, instead of judging you, tries to pass it off as uh, She's doing it because she's right. There are plenty of irritating protagonist works, things of Tony Stark and Dr. House. However, when they are being assholes, the show or movie itself condemns them and does not try to justify their behavior. Sometimes they make us laugh because we are not the object of their irony. But it is clear that they are being assholes. Of course, it helps that they occasionally show them in moments of weakness or when they open up to other characters and show that they care about the people around them. Galadriel, on the other hand, is a bitch to everyone and it almost seems like the show justifies it. Like with Captain Marvel, who sometimes has a similar irony to Tony Stark, but instead of being shown as she's been annoying to other characters, she is shown as she does that because she is likable and super powerful, trying to make this trait of hers a virtue rather than a flow. Don't be afraid to give your character flaws, and if it's a flow, treat them like such. You never know, you might be able to build a nice arc where they manage to become better people. This is very similar to what they've done with Sokka in uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. In the animated series, Sokka was uh, sexist in the first episodes, but he went through a character arc in the very few episodes where he loses that flow and became a better person. Person, and they completely uh, wiped away this flow from him in the live-action show, making Sokka a flatter character. And with that I think I've said it all. If you're interested in learning more about characterization, I'm planning to do a lot of videos about that, of character analysis and stuff like that, and if you want more arcane content it will be coming your way soon, and if you're watching from the future you'll find it here. I remember you that you can find my books on Amazon in ebook and paperback, the links are in the description, so check out my books if you like science fiction, and as always I thank my patrons for their continued support, and I wish you guys, as always, a happy reading and a happy writing. Bye!